this week in lab we're going to start looking at kinetics by studying the iodination of acetone. Kinetics is the study of the rates and mechanisms of chemical reactions. So the first thing we need to do is choose a reaction to study. As I said, we're going to be looking at the iodination of acetone. Why did we choose that reaction? Well, whenever we're looking at a chemical reaction, whenever we're looking at kinetics especially, we need to be able to easily observe some property of that reaction. Now, one of the convenient things about our studies is we don't have to observe a reactant, we don't have to observe a product, we can observe, well, pretty much anything that's easy to observe. So in this particular reaction, we want to find something that's easily observable. Acetone is, well, it's a solvent. It's a fairly common solvent. It's found in things like nail polish remover and other products. So guys, if you've got a fresh manicure, make sure you're careful, otherwise you'll mess up your nails. But it's colorless. And there are ways we can observe it, but they're not really convenient and easy ways to observe it. What about iodine? Many of you have probably seen iodine before. Here's a sample of iodine similar to what you're going to be using in lab. So this has a very, very distinct, very intense color. As we continue on with the reaction, all the products of the reaction are also colorless. So all we really have to do to follow the progress of our reaction is watch the color of iodine and watch the color of iodine disappear. Now we said we're going to be looking at rates and mechanisms of reactions. When we want to look at rates and mechanisms, we pretty much always need to consider something called a rate law. So a rate law expression is an expression that relates the initial reaction rate to the initial concentration of reactants in a chemical equation. So here's an expression of the rate law for the equation we're going to be using. You see that the initial rate of the reaction is equal to some constant, that's just a proportionality constant, times the concentration of each of the reactants raised to some power. At this point, we don't know what those powers are. And those powers aren't necessarily related to the stoichiometry of the balanced chemical equation. So our job for this experiment is to determine those rate law constants, the K values, and the orders of the reaction, the exponents on all of the, all of the concentrations of reactants. Now, the other nice thing about this reaction is iodine, in addition to being nicely colored, is also pretty easy for us to manipulate as far as determining the rate of the reaction. So for this reaction and for all the reactions we're going to be doing in this experiment, that initial rate from the rate law expression is really just equal to the rate of the disappearance of iodine. So the rate of the reaction is equal to the change in iodine concentration divided by the change in time. Throughout this experiment, we're going to be determining a couple things. So first of all, we've got our rate law expression. What are we going to figure out in that rate law expression? Well, part of the experiment is going to involve doing multiple runs at room temperature where we change the concentration of different reactants. By systematically changing the concentration of reactants and remeasuring the rate, we can figure out the value of those exponents. We can figure out the orders of the reaction with respect to each reactant. In addition to that, K, this rate law constant, is dependent on temperature. If we change temperature, we change the reaction rate. If we change the reaction rate, we must be changing the value of K, the rate law constant. So in addition to doing multiple different concentrations at room temperature, we're going to pick one set of concentration conditions, and we'll use the first set that we look at in lab. And we're going to look at that set of conditions 
at a couple different temperatures. We're going to do one cold at about zero degrees in an ice bath. We're going to do room temperature, obviously, and we're going to look at what is labeled as a cool bath. We're going to pick some temperature between zero and room temperature so that we've got three sets of temperature conditions. That's going to allow us to determine the activation energy for the process. Now, activation energy is determined using the Arrhenius equation. Depending what type of experiment you're doing and what data you've got available, there are a few different forms of the Arrhenius equation. If you only have two sets of conditions, you can use the comparative form of the Arrhenius equation. So, natural log comes into play here. We've got a ratio of rate law constants. That's equal to the activation energy over the universal gas constant, R, times the difference in 1 over the temperatures. That works great for two sets of conditions, but there's a problem with it. This form relies on our two measurements being really good. And I'm sure our measurements are going to be pretty good, but it's helpful if we can somehow assess error rather than just thinking that our two conditions must be all but perfect. So we should go ahead and calculate the activation energy using the comparative form of the Arrhenius equation for all the possible pairs. The cold and the room temperature, the cold and the cool, and the cool and the room temperature runs. But we can also, since we've got three sets of conditions, we can also use a different form of the Arrhenius equation, the linear form of the Arrhenius equation. So linear form of the Arrhenius equation, natural log of k is equal to, well again, it looks similar, now we've got a negative sign, negative Ea over R, 1 over temperature, plus natural log of A, A is the frequency factor. Well, this is the linear form. So, where's the line? If it's a linear form, we have to be able to pick out an X and a Y so that we can plot them. And if we look at this, what do we have? We've got natural log of K, well that seems kind of like Y. We've got 1 over T, that's something we're going to be changing, that seems like 1 over T might be X. That means that the slope of the expression, or the slope of the fit line to the data that we plot is going to be negative EA over R, so this should be a negative slope and it'll allow us to calculate that activation energy, that value of Ea. Now we have to talk a little bit about how we're going to do the actual experiment. So I've got a few samples already made up over here, so I'm not going to go through all that, but you're going to be making up your samples using pipettes. There are going to be some pipettes in the back of the room, and to keep these things a little bit straightened out and to keep contamination from causing problems, the pipettes are all indexed with tape. So there are four different color tapes on the pipettes because we've got four different liquids we need to pipette. We've got some that are labeled for HCl, the hydrochloric acid we're going to use, some labeled ACE for the acetone, some labeled iodine for the iodine solution, and some labeled water for water. So make sure you keep those straight. That way we won't have to worry so much about cross-contamination as we go through the day. So I've gone ahead, like I said, and made up just a couple of runs of, of run one where I'm using two milliliters of everything. Now the important thing here is setting up our two different types of test tubes. We want to study the rate of this reaction. That means that we want to be able to know exactly when the reaction starts. So if I put everything in one tube, it would start whenever things got mixed. To keep the reaction from starting, one tube is going to contain all the colorless components. The other tube is going to have the iodine in it. So as long as we keep these two separate, they're ready to go as soon as we want to mix them, but we won't have the reaction starting until we know the reaction is supposed to start. The other thing that we're going, that we're going to do is, as it says in the procedure and as I've done here, 
We're going to keep these tubes in a room temperature water bath because temperature is extremely important when we're looking at rates and when we're looking at activation energies. So we need to know the temperature of all of the samples we measure. By using a temperature bath, by using a water bath like this that's at room temperature, we'll have a more consistent temperature to record for room temperature on any given day. So make up your samples, keep them in the bath until you're ready to use them. So I think I'm just about ready for a run. Let's see if we can't make something happen here. So I have my samples ready, got my spec 20 turned on and it looks like I need to calibrate it. Okay, my zero's good. I'll do my 100% in a minute. Let's get the computer set up. On the desktop we should be able to go to chemistry and physics. We're using a spectrometer, so Spectro Pro. Now, in a lot of cases, you may come up with this dialog box to set up interface. Um, if you do, click scan and wait until it pops up an interface, the Thermospectronic 20D, Thermospectronic 20D Plus. Um, that's our spectrometer, that's the interface you need. We're ready to go. This is the open page for Spectra Pro. We want to set up a new absorbance versus time experiment. Read your dialog boxes uh, to collect data, verify the experimental setting, follow the on-screen instructions, insert sample, click collect. Okay. So we'll set it up for 15 minutes. That's longer than we'll need, but 15 minutes is okay. 60 points per minute will be one per second, so that looks good. Okay, now we're into calibration. We already did the 0%, so we'll do a done on that. Wavelength is set. Let's grab a blank cuvette, get some water in it. Into the instrument. Now I can adjust my 100%. All right, that's done. So we can click done. Now we're ready to go. All right, the computer's all set up. So now I'm ready to mix my first sample together. I calibrated the 100% while we were looking at the computer. And here's one set of tubes. That's an iodine tube and a non iodine tube for run one. They've been in the room temperature bath. This is one place where having a lab partner is kind of convenient because we want to mix these two tubes together and we want to hit collect on the computer at essentially exactly the same time that these two solutions mix because the computer is going to keep track of the time for us. So I'll do that this way with one hand because I need to click the computer at the same time and Okay, I'm just about to mix my samples together, so I'm going to get the mouse ready on the collect button. I just clicked. There I mixed. There's a little left in this tube, so let's pour these back and forth two or three times. And I'll put that back in the water bath. Okay, I just clicked collect, and you see it's starting to collect time but it's not doing anything with absorbance because I don't have anything in the, in the instrument. And that's okay because at this point all we really need is for the computer to keep track of time. Now we could immediately pour this into a little test tube and put it in the instrument, but there's really no need to. This is really, from the Spec 20's perspective, this is an extremely dark solution. So we can just let it sit and react for a little while in the room temperature water bath until it's almost ready to finish reacting. The computer's going to keep track of time for us and that's really all we need to know is the time that it takes for all of that color to disappear. All right, this has been sitting a while. The color has gotten quite a bit lighter. We could probably let it sit for a little bit longer, but let's go ahead and 
pour some of that into a little tube that'll fit in the spectrometer. It probably won't all fit. You see there's a little bit left in the big tube. That's fine. Doesn't really matter. Let's give this little tube a wipe to make sure that we've got no fingerprints or water drops on the outside. Get it in the instrument and now we can watch the color finish disappearing on the screen. My sample was starting to get pretty light colored so I popped it in the instrument and now you can see it's starting to collect data points. The absorbance is going down because the color is going away and it's going down, 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 down a little slower and all of a sudden somewhere in here it should level off and if you look over here you see that it leveled off it didn't level off at zero but that's fine all that really matters is that it leveled off all the color is gone so at this point we could go ahead and stop the absorbance on the screen is bottomed out the little bit that was left in the big tube is colorless what's in the little tube is colorless we're finished with that run of the experiment and if we want to see this data a little bit more clearly in Spectro Pro if you click on one of the numbers on the axis it lets you do your scaling this way we can tell it to scale it up to oh that was less than four minutes so let's scale it all the way up to four minutes um, Actually, let's make it easy on ourselves and scale it from two minutes to four minutes. So there's our data. The time we want is where this flattened out. So just like in Logger Pro, we can go up to Analyze, Examine, and you can see that it's giving me each of my individual data points. Go down, go down, go down. Looks like that about 0 0.01 or 0 0.009 is about where it should be. So it took somewhere around three minutes for this experiment to complete. So now we just need to clean out that tube and we can go ahead and do another run or two. Once you're ready to start a new experiment, probably doesn't hurt to go up and turn that examine off. Um, we could rescale the axis before we start, but all we really have to do is hit collect. It'll pop up with this box asking do we want to erase the latest. Say yes and off to the races one more time. Once you've done a few repeats of run number one so that you know sort of how the experiment works and how to get everything measured out, then the next thing you should do is set up a cold run. Because the cold run is at a lower temperature, it's going to take more time. So if you wait till the end to do it, uh, you're going to run out of time in lab. So after you get run one complete and do it a couple times just to make sure you work the kinks out, then you should set up a cold run. The chemicals are going to be exactly the same. You're going to use the same volumes of everything as you do in run number one. The only real difference is you're just going to do it in a cold bath. So. Similar to other experiments, ice baths are great, but ice by itself doesn't do a very good job of conducting heat because there's a lot of gas base in there. So when you make your ice bath for the cold run, fill the beaker all the way up with ice and add water to it. Now because the cold run takes a while, you're going to have to freshen this up a few times during the course of the reaction. So I'd probably start again maybe about halfway up with liquid and mash that around a little bit. If we mix these together at room temperature and then put them in the ice it won't do as much good. So. We need to get those in the ice bath to equilibrate for at least five minutes. We want to give them plenty of time to cool down before we mix things together. All right, these have been mixed, these have been in the ice bath for about 10 minutes, so everything should be 
plenty cold at this point. Now what we need to do is mix them together and watch the reaction. In this case, because the reaction is so slow, because the reaction takes so much time, we can actually follow this just by using the clock on the wall or by using, you know, use your watch. This reaction is probably going to take, could take up to about an hour, 20 minutes. So, once everything is cool, we need to be ready to mix. We can take things out for a brief amount of time just to mix them back and forth. But make sure you get those back in the ice bath as soon as possible and keep an eye on this reaction. You're going to set it aside. It's probably better if you don't let the test tube rest directly on the bottom of the beaker. So try to keep a little bit of ice under it so you don't end up with heat transfer through the bottom of the beaker. Like I said, this is going to probably take the better part of an hour, hour maybe to an hour and a half to react. So set this aside, take a peek at it every once in a while, but now go ahead and do your other room temperature runs while you're waiting. All right, our cold run has been sitting in the ice bath for a little while. You see, it's still not really changing color all that much, but that's okay, this is gonna take a while. You also see that my ice bath is starting to get kind of slushy. It's not too bad right now, but make sure you keep up on that. If it gets a little bit slushy or if there's too much water, you can always dump some of the water out carefully and just add a little bit more ice to make sure that you keep it at a fairly constant zero degrees Celsius. This, again, we're not going to ever put this sample in here because we can't maintain ice temperature in here. So this one we're just going to monitor by eye. You can see quite a bit of color there. One thing that's going to start to be a little bit more difficult as this gets paler and paler, yellow is a pretty difficult color for the human eye to distinguish when it's a really pale yellow compared to what we might think of as colorless. So to help us out with that, it's not a bad idea to just take a spare test tube that you've got lying around and put some water in it. So this is blank. This really is colorless. When you're comparing these two to each other, it becomes a lot easier to see when this still has a tiny little bit of yellow left in it if you've got something you know is colorless right next to it. So you can even just stick those both right in the ice bath. The water doesn't really need to be cold, but if you keep them in the same place, they're a little easier to keep track of. And that's this week's experiment. As far as what you do in lab, um, Repeat your runs as many times as you think you need to to give you confident results. There are a lot of calculations in this lab, but they're kind of repetitive calculations that you're doing over and over. So this is really one of the great places where plugging a lot of your numbers into Excel and having it do your calculations for you is really a good advantage. Um, a bit more. Make sure you read over the lab procedure. Make sure you take the quiz in time and We'll see you all on Thursday.